Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want more of these videos, make sure you're subscribed to this channel. You won't miss anything if you subscribe to this channel. I want to start with a question this week. Of course, we have Nebraska and Oregon. Of course, we have Oregon State back in action. Portland State's playing Washington. But I have a question for you, the college football fan in this state. Why aren't you buying tickets? Why aren't you going to home games? For the first time in 17 seasons, the University of Oregon failed to sell out a home game where they opened the season against UC Davis. They did it again in game two against Virginia. The marketing department in Oregon tells me that they still have tickets available for the other four remaining home games against Pac-12 opponents. Um, I don't know if it's the 7.30 kickoffs, maybe. I don't know if it's the cost of the tickets, maybe. I don't know if it's the fact that UC Davis and Virginia don't move the needle for some people and they want to see better quality opponents that, uh, you know, that could be it. Uh, I don't know if it's TV, the fact that the games are all on TV, that people can see the games more easily. Um, those are all theories that have been floated out there as to why Duck fans aren't going to games anymore. Um, but I think it comes down to the fact that this team is not a 10 win plus team, is not a team that we're talking about in the national picture uh, grabbing a, a college football playoff spot. And I think that core group of Duck fans that has been there for years, there's been some attrition from all of those things that I mentioned. I do think there are families who are turned off by the kickoffs and the cost of tickets and, and the lousy competition they're playing in non-conference games. But I think the biggest factor is that bandwagon Duck fan who jumped on the bandwagon and bought a Ducks jersey and painted their face and showed up at the stadium and tailgated and said, hey, I'm in, I'm a Duck fan, this is what I do. Uh, I think that fan has stepped off the bandwagon and is waiting to see if Oregon is back as a program. If I'm the Oregon Athletic Department, uh, I would try to market the final uh, four home Pac-12 games and, uh, and try to get as many people in the, sta in the stands as possible, but I also think I would put the stadium expansion talk on complete hold. I think that this is a big alarm, and given what Oregon has gone through in men's basketball with trying to fill the basketball arena, and the fact that they've had to work really hard to get rid of those tickets, I think that they don't want another headache like that on their hands. Learn from the Timbers. Keep the stadium small, keep the demand high, People love to be in the stadium, love to talk about the stadium, you create value, and that's important. I also think the Oregon Athletic Department doesn't feel that worried about it. And it surprised me at first glance that they didn't seem to care that much that the sellout streak after 17 seasons had ended. And it told me that that revenue stream from season ticket sales is not as important to that athletic department as licensing, merchandising, and television dollars. Those are fat revenue streams. And that's a shift that we've seen in the last 15 to 20 years in college athletics. We're seeing games that have airline type ticket pricing on them where they're raising a ticket for a certain game to one price according to demand and lowering another game according to demand. We see them chasing and renegotiating licensing deals mid-deal. Oregon just did that, a $60 million windfall in the summer as they redid their licensing agreement with IMG. So keep an eye on the Oregon stands through the rest of this season. I do think there's going to be empty seats even in the Pac-12 games, and I don't think that the athletic department is that worried about it. All right, Nebraska-Oregon this week, that's a big football game. Uh, it means a lot to Mike Riley. Uh, there's been a lot of theories floated as to why Mike Riley left Oregon State. Did he feel unappreciated? Uh, could he not get over and beat Oregon? Uh, I asked him a simple question today. I heard some of the news conference yesterday in the post game after your Wyoming mm -hmm. game, and obviously the focus now becomes, okay, Mike Riley leaving Oregon State again, so you have to go back through all these questions about yes. why, why you left. And <laughs> Let me throw theories out at you, and you just yeah. blast them out of the air if they're not there. Um, you didn't have the resources at Oregon State, and you're playing in the shadow of Oregon. And yeah. after a while, does that grind on you, or is that a non-factor? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've obviously heard that before, and and I think you know me well enough to know that was that was not I, I never really first of all I tried to always avoid thinking about what we may maybe people thought we didn't have or yeah. if we were disadvantaged that that's just a bad way to live and I thought we had a lot I thought we had a great place I had a ton of fun John with with all the projects that my my uh, cohort here, DVD, and I worked on outside of football. I mean, we raised money for new practice fields and for a player's lounge, I think, is one of the nicest in the country, actually. And we did a lot of stuff outside of the football part that was really fun to do. We thought, and, and 
as as we went on, you know, we thought our facilities grew. I, I sat there in my office and watched uh, an end zone and a whole new side of the stadium being built and grown. So I, I never really tried to look at it like what the other guy had because everybody's going to be different anyway. So you just try to do the best with what you had, and I thought we had a lot. As a coach, you you probably get in the business because you're a motivated person. How about theory two? Theory two is Mike Riley did things that nobody else had done in 30 years at Oregon State, and then after a while, people start going, "Does Mike Riley still have it?" Was there part of you that was like, "Hey, hey, you don't remember what it was like <laughs> to have a zero zero game or what?" You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I I think that you know I I really it it, it all happened so fast. But it was really hard for me uh, because I love Oregon State, and I had a good friend in coaching. It was actually Mac Brown that said, "Mike, you're never going to lose your connection to your state or to Oregon State, and uh, you'll always be connected there. If you want to do this job, go do it and have fun with it." You know, and that's really the point of the, my career that I, I looked at it like that as kind of one new challenge, different challenge, different conference. And a great place uh, that had historically been at the top. And so let's go see what we can do with it. And I didn't really look at it any further than that, you know. And that, and that, that kind of attitude kind of carried me through a very, very tough decision. All right, if you're a Duck fan, uh, I think it's a big opportunity for this Oregon program to try to prove itself against Nebraska. Nebraska becomes this litmus test. If you're a Nebraska fan, Oregon gives you that same challenge and that same test. Neither one of these teams are perfect. Both of these teams have had flaws in the first two games. Nebraska does some stupid things when you watch them play. Ridiculous and stupid things. And I think Oregon State fans can remember back to early Mike Riley where they had some hangover from Dennis Erickson and personnel fouls and jumping off sides. You see some of that weird 15-yard penalty, kick yourself in the, in the foot kind of stuff, shoot yourself in the foot kind of stuff from Mike Riley's team right now at Nebraska. But I like their physicality most of all in this game, and I think that is the big factor. I think they'll handle Oregon up front on both sides of the ball. I think they'll run the football in Oregon's front. I don't like Oregon's personnel in the 4-3 defense. I especially don't like those defensive tackles. They've really struggled under Brady Hoke's new, new scheme. I just think they're not talented enough, and it's too early in Brady Hoke's tenure for him to have the right personnel. So I think Nebraska's going to score 40-plus points in this game, and I think that's enough to win. I like Nebraska playing at home to beat the Oregon Ducks. If you're an Oregon State fan, look, you've got a home game against Idaho State that I think is a W, which is a great opportunity for you to uh, celebrate. You haven't had many of those in the last 15 or so tries. It's a great opportunity for Gary Anderson's program to puff its chest out a little bit and feel good. But looking around the conference during this bye week, I think Oregon State had a really good bye week. Not because of anything they did, but because as you look around the conference during this bye week, you saw a lot of problems. You saw Arizona have problems. We saw Washington State struggling. Uh, USC and UCLA looked a little better, but I think there's some vulnerability around the rest of the conference as everybody starts to look a little flawed to me. I think Oregon State, which plays hard and I think is better than they were a year ago, I look for them uh, this season to steal a victory or two that maybe we didn't have on the books for them. I see a three-win season, possibly a four-win season for the Beavers, and I think that would be a huge improvement. But it starts with winning the mulligan, winning the easy one. This is a gimme. It's teed up. It's Idaho State. You're at home. You have Boise State in two weeks. You have to win this game if you're Oregon State. Otherwise, the wheels come clean off. So I think a little bit of pressure, but I think a very winnable, makeable game for Gary Anderson and Oregon State. All right, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you want to see more of these videos. I'll post them every week, and I appreciate you watching.